So I am a biological anthropologist, uh, which means that I study the evolutionary origins of human beings. I'm also a primatologist, uh, which means that I'm interested in what the non-human primates can tell us about ourselves. So yes, we are changing tack a bit. <laughs> the primates are, there are about 300 different species of primates, um, and they're, they're grouped into four main groups. Uh, the prosimians, which are things like lemurs, which some of you might be familiar with, like from films like Madagascar. Uh, <laughs> The monkeys, the apes, which include the gorillas, the orangutans, the bonobos, and the chimpanzees, and apparently the Swedes, uh, <laughs> and the humans. <laughs> now, non-human primates have played a very important role in our attempts to understand our evolutionary origins. And the question is why? What's so special about them? Okay, why do we place so much emphasis on them as important uh, models, comparative models for understanding ourselves? And the simple answer is because they are our closest living relatives. Okay, well what does that mean? Well in biological terms it means that they are the living things with which we share the greatest proportion of genetic material. And because of this simple and some would argue somewhat arbitrary fact, primates I think have been given a special sort of a, a position of privilege among other animals. Like they're almost family. And we all know that we treat close family differently than we do distant relatives or even complete strangers. Okay? Now I want you to imagine though that we live in a world, we found ourselves in a world in which there are no non-human primates. That we are the last remaining species of a once great and diverse lineage. That we know there's a fossil record out there that was full of primates, but they're not here anymore. And this is not an entirely implausible scenario. We know that the evolution of life has been marked by stochasticity and contingency, and that if you were to rewind the tape of life and play it again, everything could be different. It's all completely random. But what would we use then? And it turns out that the, next, the group of animals that are our next closest kin on the evolutionary tree are these guys. The non, I mean, the next group of animals that are non-primates are these guys. These are the insectivora. They include things like this tree shrew, which I think Scrat is supposed to be from the Pixar animated shorts, I think. <laughs> um, and the Kaluga, which is also called a flying lemur, but it's not a lemur, it's a shrew. These are our next closest living relatives. So if there were no primates around, one has to wonder, would we look to these guys for our evolutionary origins? Would they be our new primate models? Would we interpret their behavior as somehow foundational to our own? Would we read into their cognition differently? Would we compare their vocalizations, which are little squeaks and peeps, would we compare them to human language? Which is what we do now with the monkeys and apes. Okay? I'm not trying to diss primatology here. After all, it, <laughs> it is what I do. Um, and unlike many of the apes and monkeys I've met over my career, I do not bite the hands that feed me. Um, <laughs> But I, I'm trying to put the whole endeavor of primatology into some, into some context, okay? Um, because I'm often asked, as someone who does what I do, you know, people say, Hugh, wh you know, what is it that you do? You, you seem to travel to nice places, as I confess. Um, you know, you get to look at these animals on taxpayers' money, because that's what research grants are. Um, so what am I paying it for, basically, is what they ask me. Um, and so, you know, it's, a, it's an honest question, and I have to answer it. And I think the real value of primatology is in what's, what, I call, well, what is called the cross-species cross, uh, perspective. And what that means is that if you want to try and understand uh, a particular trait that we humans have, whether it be morphological or behavioral, sometimes it's helpful to look at another species that has a similar trait and see, to see how they use it. Because otherwise, you could fall into the trap of thinking that whatever trait we have now, that it, its function is to do whatever, whatever purpose we're putting it to right now. So let's use a, a simple example, and this human hand has come up today in another talk, but um, let's think of our hands. So again, I want you to go back to this scenario in which there are no other primates on this earth. That it's just us, and then the next group are the tree shrews. 
a, a researcher might wonder, where, where did we get this? This is something quite amazing. It's something that's very unique in the animal kingdom. It's not unique in the primate world. The human hand is somewhat unique in the primate world, but you know, other primates have a hand, hand similar to ours, but if there were no other primates, we might wonder, well, where did this come from? What does it do? What do we have it for? And we might be tempted as, you know, in sort of pre-Darwinian times to say, well, we, it, it must be for whatever you use it for mostly today. And today that might be <laughs> manipulating a touchscreen. Or the other probably most useful thing we use our hands for today is driving, okay? But the nice thing about having, using the, the cross-species perspective is that we understand there's, it gives our, our trait some historical context, okay? We know that, of course, this is a hypothetical early primitive primate from roughly 30 to 40 million years ago that they used these hands for clambering around trees, for foraging, later on for grooming, and so on. Now, this might seem somewhat of a banal example, given what we know today, but pre-Darwinian times, this, sort of, this teleological approach was, not, was, was perfectly acceptable. The idea that you can infer the, func the, the purpose and the design of something through its function, okay? The idea being that God designed something to, you know, that you can infer the, the purpose of God's purpose through uh, its function, how we use it today. Now, I want to use uh, another example now. This is a more complex behavioral example. And it's not a pleasant one, but it's one that um, is an unfortunate uh, part of the human behavioral repertoire and one that uh, people from many disciplines have tried to explain. And that is uh, male sexual coercion against women. Now, when I talk about sexual coercion, I mean the whole gamut from sort of so-called mild uh, coercion, which might include uh, women having little choice about who to marry, to the nasty stuff on the other end. Um, this is something that many disciplines have weighed in on, feminist theory, psychology, sociology, but they've all tried to explain it as a uniquely human trait. About 23 years ago, a self-described feminist primatologist named Barbara Smuts co-wrote a paper uh, with her father, actually, Bob Smuts, um, looking at the occurrence of male sexual coercion. And as a feminist, she was concerned about it and also interested in its origins, but she was dissatisfied with the feminist, the, the sort of um, usual feminist uh, perspective that it was entirely a social construct and unique to humans. And she said, you know, I've been watching primates my whole life, and I see it occur in primates. But more particularly, it, it occurs in very specific contexts, okay? So what she found was, and she did a survey of all the primates, of, of non-human primates, but then looked at human societies as well. And what she found was that there, among many predictors, but one of the best predictors of how vulnerable a female non-human primate was to sexual coercion was whether or not she lived among her female kin. So some primate species live in these, their social groups are composed entirely of uh, female matrilines. So they're all, all the females are related to each other. They're born into this group. They stay in that group. They grew up in the group. Uh, so their whole social groups are their, their mothers, their daughters, their sisters, their aunts, their nieces. The males are born in and at sexual maturity they leave. And males are very peripheral to this, to the, in these species. They come, they go. Um, and they're limited or constrained in imposing their fitness interests on females, to use a biological term, by these females, who ba the, these kin who gang up on them. And what Smuts found was that if you look in many human societies, it's very similar. If, you, uh, if, if a woman leaves her family and marries into the family of her husband or moves to the family of her husband, she is much more susceptible to sexual coercion um, then if, it's, if the opposite is true, if a man moves to the village or the household of his wife, okay? Um, now, this whole uh, perspective, of course, got a lot of resistance at the time because there was this fear of biological determinism, this idea that observations of what, what is are going to be uh, misconstrued as, as uh, prescriptions for what ought to be, for what is natural. But Smuts went to great pains to say, this is not the case. She said, look, I'm using this cross-species perspective as a way for us to say, okay, we can identify the conditions under which some behaviors might occur. And therefore, maybe we can use that to predict where it might arise in human societies as well, okay? And if it's an unsavory behavior, then maybe we can do something to intervene and, and to stop it. 
Okay, so that was a, um, a very, that, that was what she was trying to do at the time with this paper. Um, and as, as primatologists or any practitioner in evolutionary biology, though, we're constantly reminded that we need to be careful of this, of biological determinism. Now I'm showing this slide because I just want to comment quickly on how we often uh, conceptualize the place of non-human primates within the pantheon of human ancestors. There's a tendency, I think, to think of all animals as a stage or a phase through which human evolution has, has successfully passed. And by implication, it means that all other animals have not successfully passed through that stage. That somehow they're constrained or retarded in their progress. Okay, um, this, this concept of progress and evolution has been very hard, to, very hard to escape, and partly it's because it's constantly reinforced by iconographies such as this. Um, and it, it sort of, uh, it gives the impression that um, life has gone through these stages and that human evolution is a series of uh, failed uh, successions of different animals. But the fact is that all of these things are still here. Okay, or at least, if not, depending on what pictures you're using, the descendants of them are still here. Okay, amoeba are still here, fish are still here, rats are still here, reptiles are still here. They have all always still been here. Okay, there's no implied principle of progress in biological evolution. Okay, so, and usually these, these um, icons often have the culmination of the, you know, the white male at the end. So, Never mind the racial and the sexist bias inherent in these things, it's just factually wrong from a biological point of view. <laughs> and in fact, Darwin himself did not use the term evolution in his first publication of The Origin of Species, okay? It's difficult to escape that idea that evolution is, a pro is not a progressive uh, force. Now, also as a primatologist, I'm often asked, are we still evolving? And I think there's a tendency, we've talked a lot about the brain today, there's a tendency to think that our brain is such a nifty adaptation, it's so, it's so cool, it's got us to where we are today, uh, surely the only way, you know, surely it'd be better just to get smarter and smarter, our brain should be getting bigger and bigger and bigger, because, you know, they're, they're what got us to where we are. Well, I can tell you right now that's not gonna happen, uh, unless women start having babies outside of their bodies, um, one of the main, the main constraints on uh, brain expansion is the size of the female birth canal. And as any mother will he here will tell you, <laughs> there is no room in there for the thing to get bigger. It's, <laughs> it's done. That's it. And there's only so much postnatal brain growth that can happen. So, The other thing you often hear is that um, human evolution is essentially over that we're buffered, our uh, culture has buffered us from the slings and arrows of nature, um, and that there's, we can't possibly evolve anymore. Well, keep in mind that evolution is just differential reproduction in different populations of a species. That is going on today, okay? There are different ethnic groups, different countries, different socioeconomic groups are having kids at different rates. That means evolution is happening. We can't see it in real time, which is again why we're sort of uh, incredulous that it goes on, but on cosmic evolutionary time, that is change. The other reason I think we don't believe evolution is occurring is because we're still stuck in this notion of progress. Of, it, it dates back to medieval times with this idea of the great chain of being, that there's a hierarchy in nature, and that or, or lower organisms uh, ascend to higher organisms, and we're still on the top of it, and above us is only God. And even if you're atheist or agnostic, you still can't help but think that evolution was somehow that humans were preordained in it, that we are the apex of a process that was inexorably leading to us, and that it can go nowhere from here. Okay, so we need to break away from that. I think we really, I mean, I'm, that's not to say there's no such thing as, you know, there's been increasing complexity, but um, again, we need to get away from this idea that progress is an inherent part of biological evolution. And of course, the last thing is, who knows, Technology throws a wild card into evolution, okay? Um, cybernetics, the integration of AI with the human brain, this is obviously gonna open up whole new vistas which are purely speculative right now, so I, I will leave those thoughts with you good folks, so thank you.